Hello and a very warm welcome to MBCF at Home. It's great to have you with us today. In our teaching, we're continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount and we're now into chapter six of Matthew and we are today looking at generosity. What does Jesus have to say about the heart posture of generosity? So if you wanna find out about that, then please do stick around for our teaching, which this week is brought to us by Joel. Let me just introduce myself. My name's Neil. Together with my wife, Jo, we are the senior leaders here at North Berwick Christian Fellowship. We're a church that meets here in North Berwick, in Scotland, in East Lothian. And if you're just joining us for the first time, then it's great to have you with us today. If you want to join us on Sundays, then we meet at 10.30 a.m. at North Berwick High School. Come along and you'll find a very warm welcome, a time for worship, a time for teaching, and a time for ministry, a chance to get some prayer. Um, So you'd be very welcome to join us there. We also have, of course, have our online service, which is what you're watching now on YouTube, which is available at Sunday at 7 p.m. if you wanna watch it as it comes out, or you can catch up anytime throughout the week. Uh, We just love having people uh, joining us though, so uh, if you're looking to join us either in person or you're joining us online, then please do get in touch. Uh, We want this to be a relationship, not just a broadcast, so uh, we'd love to know who's watching with us. Uh, So just, uh, you can email me, get in touch, Uh, and we'd love to hear from you. If you want to know more about what's happening on a week-to-week basis, about our small groups or anything like that, then I'd recommend signing up for our weekly email, which is the NBCF Connect, and the link to do that is below. In a moment, we're going to join with our teaching that Joe's bringing today, but let me just pray for us before we listen to that. God, I thank you for your words to us. I thank you that even though these words were written down and spoken uh, 2,000 years ago, that they're just as relevant to us today in our culture. And I pray, Spirit, that you would make them come to life for us, that you'd help us to, to apply these teachings to our life this week. Amen. Let's join our teaching now. So we are continuing on in our series this morning um, on the Sermon on the Mount and we're going to be looking um, into Matthew 6 um, and this is the, the subject of giving and it's the beginning of a little sub-series within the Sermon on the Mount which we'll look into. But I, I first of all want to read you a little story out of one of the commentaries that I was using this week um, as I was researching our message and it's by Tom Wright and you, you'll probably have heard of Tom Wright and I as he's talking about this passage, he he tells a story and I thought it was quite a good one. So he said, once when living in the Middle East, I went out for a walk in the afternoon. On my way home, feeling slightly hungry, I bought a bar of chocolate at a wayside stall. I got home, went to my room, made a cup of tea, unwrapped the chocolate and broke off a piece to eat. Fortunately, I glanced down at the chocolate before I put it in my mouth. When I did so, I dropped it with a shout. It was alive. Inside what looked like a perfectly ordinary bar of chocolate were hundreds of tiny wriggling worms. (laughs) It doesn't get better, so. (laughs) Jesus didn't know about chocolate, but he did know about the things that looked fine on the outside, but were rotten on the inside. Here at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, we find his shrewd comments on what it means to live a life that is, so to speak, solid chocolate all the way through. I feel it is an invitation for us just to enjoy chocolate as part of our, uh, as part of our discipleship journey. So. But that's what this message is about. It's about actually what's on the inside. And you'll notice that it really continues on the entire theme on what the Sermon on the Mount has been. about integrity and the inner core of who we are, having a good inner core, being solid chocolate. It's a discipleship value, isn't it? Be solid chocolate. We could add that into our values as a church. So let's look at our passage in Matthew 6, verse 1 to 4. And it says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets 
to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So there's a theme that runs through all these sections that we've been looking at over the last few weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, and that is our inner being, who we are on the inside. So this section is the start of three illustrations. So they're not actually commands, but they're illustrations, giving, prayer, and fasting. They're illustrations of righteousness. To give is to seek to serve, especially the needy. To pray is to seek God's face and to fast is to help us be more disciplined. Jesus expected this uh, of his disciples to be generous givers. He says when and not if, when you give to the needy. So there was an expectation this was already happening as part of their discipleship, as part of who they were, which is why they're illustrations. So generosity though in itself is not enough. It is the motivations and the thoughts of the heart when being generous. And we've seen this already all the way throughout, haven't we, the Sermon on the Mount so far. It's the inner being. It's not about murder, it's about anger. And we're going to talk more about that. So you might be thinking that this passage contradicts with the passage preached a few weeks ago on salt and light. So if we have that up in Matthew 5, 16, it says, in the same way, I, th- I think maybe have that, in the same way, let your light, no, we don't, okay. <laughs> In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay, so back a few verses, a few sermons ago, we were being told, show your good deeds to people because that is what Jesus is commanding us to do. So how do you show your good deeds? How do you know when you show your good deeds? And right now, Jesus is saying, hide them. How do you know when to do it? And it comes back to it being solid chocolate. We're all, it's all about your motive. It's all about who you are on the inside. Now, both passages are about glorifying our Father in heaven. Matthew 5 is all about showing your faith, not hiding your deeds which reveal your faith because we might be embarrassed or we might um, be anxious or we might not want that awkward moment with our neighbor. So therefore, we'll hide our, our, our faith deed because of we're feeling embarrassed. And Matthew 6 is about not being proud and arrogant in how generous we are, which would con- uh, concealing that which would glorify us rather than our Father. So it's all about motive of the heart. When my heart is to glorify and honor God, I will sorry, when my heart is to glorify and honor God, I will conceal what will elevate me and I will expose that which glorifies God. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference there that one, we are to expose because that glorifies God and one, we are to conceal because that glorifies God. So in our passage, Jesus is having a pop at the Pharisees once again. He really did not like how, he, how they elevated themselves, how they stood and shouted and they blew their own trumpets. I think it might have been quite literal. So when they were on their way to do a good deed and something that they felt should be recognized, they had somebody walk in front of them blowing a horn, blowing a trumpet. And it was a way of saying, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm doing something awesome. You should all stop what you're doing and look at what I'm doing. And Jesus is not telling us to hide our good deeds. He's saying not to do them in order to be seen, like what the Pharisees were doing. They were doing good deeds in order to be seen. And Jesus, But Jesus isn't saying don't do good deeds. He's talking about the motive of our hearts. So as I said, this is the same issue that we've been looking at throughout, our intent and the motive of our heart. So when we look back even to the subject of adultery, adultery of the heart, again, it was an issue of intent, looking at and then sexually desiring versus looking in order to desire. One's a byproduct, one's an intent and a motivation. The postures of the heart are everything. And we've seen that throughout this entire series. Our intent is determined upon what we want and what we expect from our actions. 
When we do good deeds to be seen by human beings, it is because we are looking for something from human beings. When we do good deeds to be seen by human beings, we are, it's because we're looking for something from human beings. But when we do something to be seen by God, we get something in return from God. One of the commentaries was suggesting that there's three possibilities happening inside of us whenever we do good deeds. And one, it's seeking the praise of others. Two, it's wanting to preserve our anonymity, but quietly congratulating ourselves. Like, I won't tell anybody, but good job. Good job. Well done. Awesome work there, Joe. And the third one is being desirous of the approval of our divine father alone. Hungering for the praise of people was a sin of the Pharisees. It was one of the sins of the Pharisees was hungering for the, the appraisal and the, sorry, the praise of people around them, which is why they blew trumpets saying, hey, I'm doing a really good deed here. And Jesus um, ridiculed the way that he performed. He actually kind of, the language that he used was about kind of acting kind of language. It was about performance. It was the way that people would perform in theaters. And he really ridiculed that. But when we want to do something of God, the audience of one, he will see that and reward it. So there's, a, there's an interesting part of the passage where he talks about don't let your right hand see what your left hand is seeing. And it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because it's like me then having to hold one hand. Do I do, I do one-handed giving? Is that, is that what I do? I can only give as much as my one hand can hold. So, do, do you know, it's a bit of a funny concept. But I want you to try not to think of a polar bear right now. Whatever you do, don't think of a polar bear. Who's thinking of a polar bear? Pink polar bear, yeah. You're all thinking of a pink polar bear. So to not think of a pink, to not think about a pink polar bear, you have to think of not thinking about a pink polar bear and therefore you think about a pink polar bear. <laughs> so Ella was reading my notes earlier and she was like, what the heck, mum? I was like, I know, I know. Because when you try not to think about something, you then think about trying not to think about the thing that you're trying not to think about. And it becomes very confusing and you end up thinking about the thing. And that's what this is about. It's about trying to hide your right hand from your left hand. When you say, we say this to our girls all the time, we notice this. If you say to them, don't look in that cupboard because that's where I'm keeping all your Christmas presents. Where are they going to look? That all of a sudden curiosity has been spiked. Like... I'm going to look in the cupboard. Do you know? So when you say, don't look at something, so when you say to your, your left hand, don't look at what your right hand's doing, it's like, I want to see, I want to see what's going on. And it's the same way of blowing a trumpet is what Jesus is saying here. Is It's like drawing attention to. So as soon as you say, don't look at that, all of a sudden you become curious and you want to look at what that is. But what Jesus is instructing us is instead of giving being this big mem memorable moment, He's telling, us, um, that's, uh, he's telling us to make it a lifestyle. So instead of giving being this big memorable moment, which has been marked or we've been made curious about, he's telling us to make giving a lifestyle, having giving as a lifestyle. And Dallas Willard, who we've been looking a lot at while we've been looking at this passage, says this. The kind of people who have been so transformed by their own daily walk with God, that good deeds naturally fl flow from their character are precisely the kind of people whose left hand would not notice what their right hand is doing. As, for example, when driving one's own car or speaking one's own native language, what they do are pervasively and internally. These are people who do not have to invest a lot of reflection in doing good for others. Their deeds are in secret, no matter who is watching, for they are absorbed in love of God and of those around them. They hardly notice their own deed and rarely remember it. It's pretty good, isn't it? This, this idea of giving so becoming a lifestyle, so out in the open that they don't even notice that they're doing it. That this is when the right hand doesn't see what the left hand is doing because it's no big deal. It's just giving. It is just a lifestyle of giving. The question is not so much then about what the hand is doing, but what the heart is thinking while the hand is doing it and making it a lifestyle. I like that thought. It's not so much about what the hand is doing, but what the heart is thinking 
while doing it? What's my heart thinking while I'm giving? So this whole passage is about giving as a lifestyle, something which Jesus expected us to do. Not doing it so that we look good or feel good, but doing it for our Father who will reward us. If we have 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 7 up, should be there. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bount bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So one of our values at NBCF is, is give. I think we have that as well. It's called being generous and joyful. Remember when we did our values series and we, Neil and I have spent time talk, um, praying about what our vision and values are as a church. One of our values is as a church, we are generous and joyful. That we value living generously with our time, our resources, our skills and our money. We have a generous God who we cannot outgive. We give with a joyful heart as an act of worship. And that's who we are in BCF, is that we are a generous and joyful people here at NBCF. So how can we make this a lifestyle, you might be asking. That's great, Joe, but how do I make it a lifestyle? And there are ways that we can grow as generous people that help us become generous as a lifestyle. Ways that don't sound a trumpet or create a fanfare. And in the same way that Neil shared a while back on cultivating a lifestyle of discipleship, we, could, we too can do the same with giving. We can cultivate a lifestyle of generosity. And that doesn't have to be just money. If you're sitting listening to this, it's not just about money. Generosity goes beyond our bank accounts. First, why don't you ask yourself, what are you good at? What are you good at and what thing is it you possess that you can give? It might be your hospitality. It might be your time. It might be your money. It might be your skills. And this is one of the most beautiful things about the kingdom of God, isn't it? We're so diverse. We're so different. There are people in the kingdom of God who have money and they're called to give money. There are people in the kingdom of God who have time and they give their time. There are people in the kingdom of God who have skills that are needed because we're all different and diverse. So what is it that you possess that you can give, that you can be generous with? And start giving yourself, setting yourself, giving goals. Set yourself giving goals. How can I give? How can I be generous? How can I see a need and meet it? Now, tithing is a great way to establish a lifestyle of giving. At NBCF, we rely on tithes for our church to function. And we receive this through um, tithes that come in by direct debit most often, which is an automatic way to give without thinking. So for Neil and I, one of the ways that, that we try to live as generous people is that we give our, some part of our income as a tithe, and it comes out as a direct debit. And it's just an ability that's become a lifestyle that becomes out without thinking. Every month it comes out without thinking. And when a financial one-off gift is given, just that automatic thinking that I give back to God through tithing, that I give back to God. And so for us, tithing has become part of our lifestyle. It's become part of our giving lifestyle. If you want more information about how you can tithe to the church, then please speak to Peter. You can give your time. A great way to be generous is, to, is to, to give, is to be generous with your time. And we have people in this church who give so much, who the church just would not run, would not function without the generosity of some people's time. And that is also why we love working with organizations like Safe Families, where people get to volunteer to spend time with those who are in need of extra support. And I know that some of you in this church have done that as well. It's making time, C cultivating time into your, or creating time and capacity in your calendar week to give to other people who need input, who need support, making it a lifestyle and making it part of your weekly plan. And I get it, I get it. Life is busy and sometimes it feels like you've just got too much to do, but trying to create space for giving. And you can start small and see how it goes. 
Maybe it's volunteering at church. Maybe it's signing up onto one of the rotas. Maybe it's volunteering in a local community centre or a local charity or taking your neighbour out or driving a friend to appointments or picking up the post for somebody, putting out your neighbour's bin. It doesn't have to be large and ceremonious like what the, the Pharisees did, but it can be small and subtle and part of a lifestyle. But you can start by asking yourself, how can I help? How can I help? There's been so many times in our lives when we felt the Lord's challenge to be generous. And I'll be honest, usually it feels costly. It usually feels costly. But we don't give because we will be rewarded. We, but the Lord does love to see our giving and he will reward us. But we don't give because of that reward. We give because we want to glorify our Father in heaven. I want to tell you a story of the time that we were living out in Bethel and um, it was financially harder second year than it was our first year because we'd used all of our money savings and whatnot in our first year and uh, second year it was it was harder financially and um, we only had about four thousand pounds in our bank account and we needed about ten thousand to last us the year um, because we had flights and tuition fees and then our monthly kind of costings and things and we needed about ten thousand pounds but we had four and when we arrived back in Bethel for our second year we felt God say give all your money away and we were like oh my goodness but we'd been in this environment of faith for a year now and it it felt like second nature and I I do remember just giving it without second thought. And we just were like, yeah, okay, because we were so expecting that if God's called us, then he'll meet us where, where we were. And within a week, we had the entire 10,000 pounds that we needed for the rest of the year. God rewards our willingness to respond to him. He rewards our willingness to respond to him. And sometimes it's about just creating that little bit of capacity in our week just for God to move. Whether it's like, I know people who, who have savings accounts that are specifically forgiving. And so they've created capacity in their financial life that if a need ever came up, they can just give automatically. We know people like that. We know people who create capacity in their diary time-wise so that if a neighbor's need ever came up, they can just do that. And I think this is about creating capacity in our lives in whatever form that is to live a lifestyle of generosity so that your right hand doesn't see what your left hand is doing because you have that capacity there. It's just there and it's there to be used and it's there to be blessed. But sometimes it is just as simple as asking the question, how can I help? How can I help my neighbor? How can I help the church? How can I help my friend? How can I help? A lifestyle of giving isn't a short-term thing. It is a lifestyle and a commitment. Like a puppy's just not for Christmas and generosity isn't just for the season. It is a lifestyle. It's an adaptation of how we do life. With our hearts postured to glorify God, we give to glorify God. And giving is a service to people around us, whether that's financial, time, or however that might be that you have the ability and the skill for. I want to show us a video if we can just get that ready next and I, I do warn you it's a bit of a tearjerker I've watched it a few times in preparation for today and I've cried every single time so I may again cry again today and you may have seen it already it's the John Lewis Christmas advert and I, I'm just going to show that just now if we can have that up. This whole advert is about how this man was preparing to become, to adopt this girl and how he was, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting all emotional, and how he was adapting him. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> it just like gets me in here. <laughs> and how he was adapting something in his lifestyle for somebody else. And I watched this other video on the back of it and it was John Lewis being, <laughs> being interviewed about this video. And they said about the advert, it's designed to stop, to make you stop and ask, how can I help? And I thought if there was a, ever a message so in tune with the spirit of giving and a heart of a giver, it was this, how can I help? 
And this is the message of Jesus to us. How can I help? How can I so glorify my Father in heaven that I ask the question, how can I help? So I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to pray. And if we have the worship band come up and we're just going to go back into a time of worship. God, I thank you for your, your love. God, I thank you that you are a generous and a giving father. God, and I pray that you would help us to stop and ask, how can I help? How can I give in a way that seeks to serve? How can I give in a way that glorifies you? How can I give in a way that has become a lifestyle? How can I create capacity in my life so that I can give and be generous and serve those around us. God, as a church at NBCF, our heart is to give, is to be generous and joyful in our giving. And God, I thank you for the generosity within this church. And I pray that we would continue to be that, that we continue to be a church that says, how can I help? How can I help in our community? How can I help in our town? How can I help with my neighbor? How can we help? How can we help North Berwick? How can we serve and give generously to North Berwick? Thank you for your presence and thank you for your word. Amen. Well, great to have you with us today. Hopefully you found that teaching helpful and, and helps you engage with God's relevant words to our life. If you want to let us know that you've been watching, then please do get in touch on email. We'd love to hear from you. Well, we're praying for you guys. We pray that you have an awesome week. We pray that you know God's presence with you and in you through the good times and the hard times. And we, we pray his blessing upon you. See you soon. Bye.